This chapter focuses on chronic kidney disease. The learning objectives are as follows. To understand the measurement of kidney function, to review the definition and classification of chronic kidney disease, or CKD, and end-stage renal disease, or ESRD, to learn the basic pathophysiology of CKD, to review the complications of CKD, and to understand basic management of CKD and ESRD. We will cover the following topics. An overview of CKD and glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, epidemiology, classification, pathophysiology, complications, and management of CKD, and an overview of ESRD. Chronic kidney disease is defined as kidney damage or decreased kidney function lasting greater than three months. GFR is the usual measure of kidney function. It is estimated using one of several validated equations, most of which are based on serum creatinine measurements. One can also directly measure GFR using clearance of certain substances, such as iothalamate, though these measurements are generally confined to specific clinical or research settings. CKD is estimated to affect about 10 to 12 percent of the population in the United States. The primary etiologies of CKD are diabetes and hypertension. Numerous clinical and laboratory markers serve as risk factors that impact the course of CKD. These include degree of proteinuria, hypertension, type of underlying kidney disease, African American race, male gender, obesity, hyperlipidemia, smoking, high protein diet, phosphate retention, and metabolic acidosis. CKD is classified by stages. The primary classification system has been outlined by the National Kidney Foundation's Kidney Disease Outcomes Quality Initiative, or KDOKI. Stage 1 CKD denotes an estimated GFR of greater than 90 with persistent albuminuria. Stage 2 includes GFR of 60 to 89 with persistent albuminuria. Stages 3 and 4 include GFR ranges of 30 to 59 and 15 to 29, respectively. A GFR of less than 15 represents stage 5 CKD, at which point renal replacement therapy may be under consideration. There is another classification system for CKD that has been established by the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes Foundation, or KDGO. As depicted in the right-hand column, this system includes separate classification for GFR and albuminuria. The pathophysiology of CKD is complex and multifactorial. In general, the first step in the process involves renal injury due to acute and or chronic processes such as ischemia, toxic exposures, and obstruction, among many other causes. The injury leads to loss of nephrons, which triggers glomerular capillary hypertension as a compensatory mechanism to maintain overall glomerular filtration by the remaining nephrons. This compensation eventually leads to hyperfiltration weakening the glomerular membrane and increasing its permeability to macromolecules, including proteins. Increased filtration of proteins leads to not only proteinuria, but also excessive tubular reabsorption of protein, which in turn causes activation of inflammatory and vasoactive substances in the renal interstitium. These changes promote tubular cell transdifferentiation and fibroblast proliferation, which lead to fibrogenesis and eventually renal scarring. It is important to note that several steps of this process are mediated by angiotensin II, as depicted in the diagram. Once a patient has been diagnosed with CKD, there are several important features of how the condition should be managed. First, one must address potential reversible causes of CKD. These may include decreased renal perfusion, for instance, due to congestive heart failure or excessively controlled blood pressure, nephrotoxic drugs such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and urinary tract obstruction from conditions such as benign prostatic hypertrophy. Once reversible causes of CKD have been addressed, the mainstay of CKD management is controlling disease progression. This usually involves relatively strict control of blood pressure, currently to a target of less than 130 over 80, optimizing management of underlying causes such as hyperlipidemia, hyperglycemia, and smoking, and careful dosing of medications to avoid their nephrotoxic effects and or adverse effects due to reduced renal clearance of drugs.
An important consideration is when to refer a patient for evaluation by a nephrologist. Most clinical guidelines recommend that once a patient reaches stage 4 CKD with an estimated GFR of less than 30, he or she should be seen by a nephrologist. Patients may be referred earlier depending on individual patient circumstances and the comfort level of other providers in managing CKD. CKD is associated with several metabolic complications with which you should be familiar. Most of these are more likely to occur during stage 4 CKD, though their pathophysiology often begins in stage 3 CKD. One complication is volume overload, which is usually managed with dietary sodium restriction and diuretic therapy if needed. Another complication is hyperkalemia, managed with dietary restriction of potassium, and caution with medications that may raise serum potassium, such as ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Metabolic acidosis is a third complication, initially treated with oral bicarbonate or other base. Hyperphosphatemia is also common, controlled with dietary restriction of phosphorus and phosphate-binding medications. Renal osteodystrophy may occur due to secondary hyperparathyroidism that often accompanies CKD. This is managed by suppressing parathyroid hormone with control of hyperphosphatemia, activated vitamin D analog therapy, and or calcium emetic agents. Hypertension is frequently associated with CKD as both an etiology and a complication. The usual goal of blood pressure control for patients with CKD is less than 130 over 80, particularly for patients with proteinuria in excess of 500 mg per day. Blood pressure control is often achieved with the use of multiple agents, including ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, and diuretics, among others. Anemia may develop as CKD progresses due to decreased production of erythropoietin. Affected patients should be ruled out for iron deficiency and otherwise may be treated with erythropoiesis-stimulating agents. Finally, dyslipidemia is a common condition seen among patients with CKD. Patients should have a target low-density lipoprotein level of less than 100 mg per deciliter, achieved by lifestyle modifications and medications if necessary. As CKD progresses, patients may reach end-stage renal disease, or ESRD, defined as the point at which a patient requires chronic renal replacement therapy. Clinical indications for renal replacement therapy are the same as those in acute kidney injury, though patients with CKD often gradually progress to these indications rather than experiencing emergent situations. These indications include metabolic acidosis, electrolyte disturbances, particularly hyperkalemia, intoxication from drugs or other exposures, volume overload, and uremia. Of note, the initial goal is usually to manage any of these indications with conservative management if feasible, prior to initiating renal replacement therapy. Often the most subtle or variable indication for renal replacement therapy is uremia. Uremia may manifest as altered mental status, poor appetite, nausea, dysgeusia, poor energy, weight loss, pericarditis, and or pruritus. It is important to monitor for these symptoms as renal function declines. Once a decision is made to initiate renal replacement therapy, the two modalities are hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. Renal transplantation is also considered to be renal replacement therapy, though patients are usually simultaneously evaluated for dialysis options as they approach candidacy for transplantation. Details of dialysis are discussed elsewhere. It is important to familiarize yourself with certain complications of ESRD that pertain to uremia. The first is malnutrition, which is assessed both by physical exam and specific parameters such as serum albumin and caloric intake. Next is uremic bleeding, which occurs due to platelet dysfunction. Management of uremic bleeding includes correcting anemia if present and considering medications such as desmopressin, cryoprecipitate, or estrogen. Dialysis also helps correct uremic bleeding if conservative measures fail. Finally, uremic pericarditis is potentially a serious complication of ESRD. This condition may not produce the usual EKG changes associated with pericarditis due to a lack of epicardial involvement, so it is important to maintain a high clinical suspicion based on symptoms and physical exam. Uremic pericarditis is primarily managed with urgent dialysis. 
In summary, CKD is a prevalent condition primarily stemming from other chronic diseases such as diabetes and hypertension. Classification of CKD stages helps to monitor renal function and complications of CKD, determine timing of nephrology referral, and preparation for renal replacement therapy. Management of CKD entails addressing reversible causes, slowing progression of CKD, and treating complications. Finally, as CKD progresses, initiation of renal replacement therapy in ESRD is determined by specific metabolic and symptomatic indications, though it is important to tailor management to individual patient needs and preferences.